Quantum Matter seminar. I'm very happy today to have uh, Roger Mung from University of Pittsburgh tell us about universal multipartite entanglement in quantum spin chains. So uh, take it away. Okay. Hey, quantum matter. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, virtually here. Um, so yes, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, a certain type of multi-partite entanglement. Uh, before we begin, of course, uh, these are the uh, people who have uh, done uh, most of the work. Uh, Yi Jin, who is currently in perimeter. Um, and I, uh, this is also in collaboration with uh, Michael Zalato's group in uh, UC Berkeley and his uh, two students, Karthik and Tomo. All right, so uh, <clears throat> to um, motivate uh, the topic, all right, so quantum entanglement, uh, all right, so quantum entanglement is, uh, <clears throat> is this phenomena. Um, so for example, uh, systems can be correlated um, in certain ways. Uh, that are beyond classical phenomena. So uh, historically, uh, one of the most exciting things that led up to uh, <clears throat> quantum information were uh, EPR pairs, uh, named after Einstein, uh, Podolsky, and Rosen, uh, and Bell's theorem. Uh, and of course, there's a number of applications that comes out of quantum information, includes quantum cryptography and uh, various algorithms for quantum computing. And one of the key tenets uh, when studying quantum information is the uh, quantum entanglement entropy, um, which uh, in this particular case, uh, I'm going to, whenever I say entanglement entropy, I meant the Von Neumann entropy. Um, and it's useful because it measures uh, uh, basically the amount of correlations. Uh, now, strictly speaking, the entanglement entropy doesn't distinguish between quantum versus classical correlations. And basically for the remainder of my talk, I'm not really going to make that distinction. <clears throat> uh, um, and specifically, uh, recently there's been a lot of applications of uh, quantum information and uh, true condensed matter physics. And very specifically, uh, it's about diagnosing quantum systems. Um, <clears throat> All right, so uh, here are some examples of uh, entanglement scaling. So for example, when you have a one plus one DCFT um, uh, on a line and you take a segment of it, which is L long, the entanglement entropy scales uh, with the, uh, the subsystem size L um, uh, dependent on the central charge. It's uh, C over three log of L. Now, uh, there's a few things I want to point out. The first thing is that there's a denominator, uh, A, which in this case, uh, you should think of as the last length scale. It acts as the UV cutoff for this formula. Um, um, and you can kind of think of this as kind of equivalent to O1 order term, uh, which you should think about uh, as kind of UV physics that's coming from the boundary uh, of your cut, like right here and right here. Uh, <clears throat> We also uh, know for uh, 2 plus 1D topological phases. So these are gap topological phases like the quantum hall uh, gap spin liquids. Uh, Kataya Presco and Levin Wen basically uh, came up with uh, the general form for the entanglement entropy. So in this case, you have a 2D uh, phase and you basically cut out a region with perimeter L. The entanglement entropy of the region with its uh, surrounding is proportional uh, to L. That is what's known colloquially as the area law. But they realized that there was a uh, extra term, gamma, which they call the topological entanglement entropy. So that's the universal part. The gamma is the universal part. <laughs> and of course, uh, there's also many other phases for which we have a certain idea of how the entanglement scales. Uh, on the topic of entanglement, uh, Lee and Haldane also introduced the idea of the entanglement spectrum and how the spectrum uh, uh, gives us a, a lot of information. So basically the idea is that an entanglement spectrum is the eigenvalue of a density matrix. Uh, what's shown here on the uh, right is a plot of the uh, all the eigenvalues 
boosts the uh, momentum. In this particular case, this is uh, a DMRG uh, data of uh, the wheat Rizai phase, uh, which is a specific quantum Hall phase. <clears throat> and what Lee and Haldane pointed out was that uh, the entanglement spectrum basically encodes uh, the uh, edge spectrum spectra for the actual physical phase, even though uh, you're looking at a bulk wave function. And this was useful because it can be used to identify the type of uh, topological phase uh, it is purely just from the ground state. <clears throat> uh, and then uh, there's a number of other things you can actually identify in addition to edge spectrum, such as uh, Hall viscosity, central charge, etc. <clears throat> All right, so this is kind of a, a bit of a, a review of uh, what entanglement, uh, how entanglement has been used to uh, look at ground states. <clears throat> In general though, uh, almost all these entanglement measures are UV dependent. And basically what that means is that this, there is a universal piece, but there's also like a non-universal piece that depends on uh, specific physics at the lattice length scale. Um, uh, so for example, uh, in the one plus one D case, it depends on A right here. The universal piece that you want to extract is the central charge but uh, the non-universal piece is the order one piece or equivalently the last length scale. Similarly in the, uh, the TQFT formula, gamma is the universal part, but the leading term alpha coefficient is the non-universal part. Um, and sometimes uh, you need translational invariance in order to uh, extract some of these quantities. In particular, for example, the uh, trying to get central charge out from entanglement. And because of these non-universal pieces, typically you need some finite size scaling in order to uh, extract the piece that you're interested in. And importantly, uh, if you didn't have translational symmetry, sometimes it just wouldn't work because it means that the non-universal part uh, is different between different system sizes. So a disorder system, for example, is, will be really hard to diagnose uh, using these measures uh, for a single uh, uh, instance of a system. Of course, there's various UV independent measures that you can uh, look at. For example, uh, the degeneracy of the entanglement spectrum is UV independent. Um, the topological entropy can also be extracted uh, using a certain clever subtraction uh, introduced uh, by these authors, um, which tries to subtract the UV dependent stuff. And so the point of what I want to talk about today is I want to introduce two new measures, entanglement measures, um, which happens to be UV independent for 1D spin chain. And basically what that means is that when you uh, compute these entanglement measures, you don't have to worry about lattice length scale physics. They basically are subtracted away. Um, and for the lack of better names, they're called G and H. Uh, and after I introduce them, I'll talk about the properties and uh, certain physical uh, interpretation, what they can diagnose and what, uh, um, uh, and what looks uh, different or the same under these entanglement measures. Okay, so are there any questions uh, before we go on? Okay, I'll take that as a no. All right, so before we begin, uh, I want to introduce- uh, Excuse me, maybe yes. I say, uh, do you focus on uh, one dimensional space? Uh, the, the things that I'm going to define doesn't depend on the dimensionality, but the properties that they have depends on the dimensionality. And then uh, I'll briefly talk about 2D uh, uh, at the end, but it's mostly 1D. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, first uh, I, I'm going to define the idea of mutual information. Uh, mutual information, um, uh, uh, which is uh, for two systems, AB, subsystems, I should say, it's basically defined as follows, uh, SA plus SB minus SAB. Um, it turns out this quantity is always uh, non-negative. And just for a, certain, uh, a number of examples. So if you look at say a uh, Bell state, which is pure on AB, um, and this is an example of a Bell state right here, uh, the mutual information will give you, uh, in this case, uh, two log two. And it basically tells you that the uh, A I guess I should label this as A and this is B, uh, correlated. Um, on the other hand, if you look at product states, uh, uh, in the following form, there is no mutual information. 
Another uh, interesting class is what we call separable states, which is basically a sum of product states um, subject to the condition, this sum of organality uh, conditions. Um, and in this particular case, uh, the, there is mutual information between the two parties A and B. Uh, and so mutual information captures basically a certain amount of correlations between uh, the two parties. <clears throat> All right, so um, if you were to apply the mutual information to let's say a phase and look at two uh, neighboring regions, so in this case, uh, A and B, so you should imagine like this, this phase is a band, uh, um, uh, that the region outside is also a, a part of the phase. But if I look at two subregion uh, A and B, and I look at the mutual information, um, basically uh, what you get is that you get a uh, uh, two times, uh, sorry, you get uh, S of A on the left, S of B on the right, minus S of AB. Now, if this was a gap phase for which we know it obeys uh, the area law, then all the contribution for the entropy is gonna come from the boundary. So in this particular case, if it was a gap phase, then you're going to get uh, uh, the contribution from this box, this box minus this box. And after that, you're gonna see that you get two times uh, whatever is uh, the boundary share by A and B. So in this particular sense, you can see how uh, it is uh, about information that is shared between A and B. And what this kind of subtraction does is that it subtracts away at least uh, 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 inf uh, any correlations between A and the environment or B and the environment, but it still keeps the correlation between A and B all of it. And in this particular case, you would still expect it to follow some sort of area law. In particular, it will be the area uh, interface between A and B. On the other hand, if you have uh, two regions that aren't touching each other, then this area uh, intersection wouldn't exist. And so in this particular case, uh, it does tell you a certain amount of information about the phase. Um, if you had a gap phase, then you would expect there to be no mutual information in the thermodynamic limit, as opposed to a gapless phase, which would typically encode some geometric uh, uh, feature of your phase. So this is an example uh, uh, of an entanglement measure, but it, it is UV dependent because uh, basically of this feature between A and B. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, reflect entropy. So before that, I'm gonna have to introduce a few topics. So the first one is uh, what the purification is. So uh, given the density matrix on A, a purification uh, uh, turns the density matrix into a pure wave function on a bigger system, in this case, say AC, um, such that when you trace out the uh, extra piece C, uh, you get back your density matrix. Uh, uh, purifications are particularly useful um, and there's this thing called actually like the church of the large Hilbert space, which is if you don't want to deal with density matrices, you can always just work with a larger Hilbert space for which your system is pure. So we say that C purifies A in this particular case. All right, um, there's a specific purification called a canonical purification where um, the purifying space is basically uh, isomorphic to uh, your, uh, the original space. And the way you should think about it is that the way you will construct it is you have a density matrix on A, you diagonalize it, and there'll be a bunch of eigenvalues P and a bunch of eigenvectors uh, U. And the canonical purification is basically uh, uh, has coefficient, you take the square root of it basically, uh, square root of P, and um, you basically use the same, uh, you use the eigenvectors of your density matrix to purify yourself. And so you end up having a, a wave function on a system that is basically twice as big, A, a, uh, a and I'm gonna call A bar the purify psi. Uh, and basically this is like just taking the square root of the density matrix and using that as the wave function. Okay. All right, so the reflect entropy uh, which was introduced recently, it's basically uh, for uh, uh, AB subsystem, it's basically what you do is you take the density matrix, row AB, and then you canonically purify it. Um, and so that means A gets double, B gets double. And then in the canonical purify system, you look at the entanglement uh, entropy of AA ball. So this is the definition of uh, the reflect entropy. Uh, excuse me? Yes. Just want to make sure, what's the U star? Uh, 
uh, when you, um, uh, that's, that's complex conjugation of you. Um, it's because I need to turn a uh, bra into a cat. Uh, I, I guess it's a little bit uh, actually un, uh, actually no it is necessary there um, so if you were to do this numerically um, uh, the a bar space is actually time reversal of a it's like it's like a time reversal copy of a but I can choose it to be the same as you can tell uh, yeah yeah so so that would be a valid purification but the canonical purification you kind of do this procedure Okay, I see. We just take the uh, complex conjugate. Uh huh. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Um. So uh, I'll I'll explain pictorially what it will do for one D quantum spin chain. So uh, imagine you have a spin chain um on the line. Um. And so uh, there's a bunch of sites here, and I have a region A here, I have a region B, uh, in this uh really long spin chain. The basic idea of what the canonical purification does is that it takes AB and it produces A bar, B bar, which are basically copies of AB in such a way that it's pure. And so basically what it does is it turns a wave function on a, uh, in this case, a line, a segment of the line into a wave function on a circle. So that's the basically what canonical purification does uh, for a uh, basically 1D system. And in fact, this idea generalizes if I, let's say, have a uh, 2D phase and I basically uh, take A and B um, and I were to canonically purify it, then basically what uh, you get is that you get a, uh, uh, a sphere where you have A, B, A bar, B bar. So this is actually a great way to uh, change the topology of your wave function uh, by using a canonical purification. Uh, so, uh, yes. I just want to make sure in what sense the purified state is a circle. Uh, uh, if this was a, a gap wave function, A B, in some phase, um, the canonical purification will also be a gap wave function in the same phase. Uh, that's one way to think about it. This turns out this concept kind of also works for uh, gapless stuff, uh, for CFTs. Uh -huh. So this is kind of why I'm drawing it this way, because like if you start dealing with uh, grand states of uh, certain Hamiltonians, it turns out when you do canonical purifications, uh, there's certain reasonably nice properties uh, that you end up having. So one thing, of course, is that uh, when you do, uh, since it's a purification, if I, let's say, trace out uh, the top half, so let's say if I trace out this half, A bar, B bar, um, the remaining wave function is going to look identical to A, B because it's a purification. So for example, if you look at any uh, uh, subsystem uh, of this, it looks identical to uh, uh, the subsystems of the quantum spin chain. So that's an example of, uh, it locally looks the same. Yeah, that I understand. But I guess my question is, now in this figure, it seems uh, it's tempting to interpret the interface between A and A bar as some, some local region in the space. You mean like this stuff? Yeah, but when we do purification, I I think of it as some just as some abstract mathematical construction. Uh, am I supposed to interpret this interface as something more, as something that has more physical meaning? Well, it is. Uh, uh, well, okay. So uh, maybe I can phrase it that way. Um, so. Uh, A B typically will not be a pure uh, pure state. Um, uh, if AB was a pure state, if you take a pure state, it's canonical purification is really boring. It's just basically like two separate, the product of two pure states. So A is, uh, uh, in, uh, you, you expect A to be entangled with the environment right here. That entanglement um, in the canonical purification manifests itself uh, as entanglement between A and A bar. So uh, in some sense, uh, Yes, the canonical purification is a very uh, 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 technical procedure, but you can think about the output it produces is that it mimics uh, uh, the original system a bit and it reproduces entanglement with neighboring uh, uh, cells. I see. Maybe a way to ask the question is, if say we start with a ground state of some Hamiltonian, 
Mm -hmm. Is there a reasonable Hamiltonian we can write on this circle whose ground state is this purified state? Uh, I'm going to kind of answer you saying that if you actually have a matrix product state uh, uh, um, describing, say, a quantum spin chain uh, of sufficient size, then this canonical purification is also a matrix product state where the, uh, the individual elements looks the same. Okay, very cool. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right. So uh, the entanglement measure that I want to introduce, or at least the first one, which we call H, I'm going to do H first, is basically defined as the reflected entropy minus the uh, mutual information. So uh, I'm just defining H right here. Um, in this picture I just basically used earlier, um, it basically amounts to, okay, so if you were to apply to a 1D quantum spin chain, um, you construct a canonical purification, and this is basically the quantity where the first one is the reflected uh, 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 entropy and the next three terms uh, represents the uh, mutual information. All right, so what I want to uh, first talk about uh, is I want to discuss is, uh, various properties, like why did we define this, why is it useful, et cetera, and what uh, information it gives us. And so uh, the main bullet points uh, is non-negative, which I'll show it in a second. Um, it vanishes for ground states of any gap Hamiltonian in the thermodynamic limit. It also vanishes for cat states, which I'll explain. Uh, cat is in Schrodinger's cat. And then uh, for CFTs, it's universal. Can you flash the definition again? Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to show it a few more times. All right. So uh, to show uh, it's non-negative, um, here's a circle. Um, Now I'm basically drawing this, uh, uh, I'm proving it's non-negative for basically all cases. So whenever I'm drawing a circle of four pieces, like you should think about it as just being a quad partition with, uh, without any geometry involved. So H of uh, A comma B is equals to again, uh, S of A A bar plus S of A B minus S of a minus S of B, this is just the definition. And basically uh, it's just pause, it's non-negative because of strong subadditivity. In particular, what we're going to do is we're gonna rewrite SB as S A, A bar, B bar. And that's because the entire system is pure. So the entropy of a subregion is the same as this complement. And basically by a strong subadditivity, this is uh, greater than zero. So uh, uh, strong subadditivity basically says that uh, if I have free region, uh, if I have uh, ABC, it basically says that S of AB plus SBC is greater than or equals to SABC plus SB. And it turns out that this expression is exactly that uh, for A, A bar, B bar. Um, and so therefore it is uh, non-negative. All right, so what does H look like for gap system? Okay, so I'm going to give basically a uh, heuristic proof for now. Um, so in a gap system, all the entanglement comes from basically the edges uh, with the boundaries. Um, the area law in 1D basically is the, the number of boundary points. So uh, SSA bar is basically this arc, so the boundary being the, uh, the top and bottom points. SAB is this arc, and then, uh, uh, so the boundaries being these two points, whereas SA, the boundary is here, and SB, the boundary is right here. So for any state that obeys uh, the area law, you can see that all the boundaries cancel. So, uh, uh, so the, uh, the left point uh, is canceled by this uh, point. The right point is canceled by this point. The top point and the bottom point are the same because uh, there's a reflection symmetry whenever you do canonical purification. So uh, the bottom point uh, basically shows up twice and basically this uh, uh, goes to zero. This is basically the heuristic proof of why it shows up. And it's because I've chosen the sub uh, subtraction that gets rid of all the uh, UV physics. <laughs> um, uh, so, I'm going to uh, uh, give a slightly more technical variation um, uh, uh, of what I meant uh, by gap states and uh, by uh, introducing uh, polygon states. 
Um, all right, so uh, the idea of a polygon state is that what we're going to do is that we're going to uh, take uh, uh, A and we're going to divide it um, heuristically, um, not, not spatially, but I'm, we're going to divide the Hilbert space A in terms of pro product of a left piece times the product of a right piece. And we're going to do the same with B. Oh, by the way, uh, what's the time? I don't have a clock with me. You have okay. a one hour, one more hour. Oh, thank you. Only one more hour. One okay. hour and five minutes. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide the left half A and we're going to divide uh, uh, the right half B. Um, and then um, I'm gonna call uh, the environment E and in particular, I'm gonna call this the left half of the environment and this is the right half of the environment. Basically a polygon state uh, uh, in this particular case is if I can write a wave function uh, on a, B, and E in the form of some wave function living on uh, the left of E and A left, tensor some wave function on A, R, B, L, tensor B, R, E, R. Okay, so basically I'm calling something a polygon state if I can subdivide A uh, as a Hilbert space, subdivide B as a Hilbert space, such that the wave function solely lives, uh, can be written as a, a product of free wave functions. Um, <clears throat> um, now this division doesn't actually have to happen uh, uh, physically uh, uh, through A, and in fact, in general, it won't because any cut you make, there'll be entanglement across it. But we're basically saying that, um, uh, we can kind of disentangle that into like an AL and AR part. Another way to kind of visualize what that means in a tensor language is that um, if I were to start with uh, a product state on six uh, uh, legs, where um, this one is EL, these two are A, these two are B, and this one is ER, I can write my wave function phi as equals to a unitary acting on, no, that's not what I want. A unitary acting on uh, these two, a unitary acting on these two, and a unitary acting on these two. So that's another way to visualize. Uh... <clears throat> uh, that's another way to visualize uh, in the tensor language uh, what a polygon state is. Uh, any questions? So I'm just defining what a polygon state is. I'm sorry, this cannot be I'm gonna set up any transition in invariant Hamiltonian, right? Uh pardon? This cannot be I'm gonna set up any translationally invariant Hamiltonian. Uh well, okay. So um the way you should think about a polygon state, I'll answer your question in a second. The way you should think about a polygon state is that this is the um uh what happens when you take any gap state with a finite correlation length and you take the firm with dynamic limit. Because it means that any region A, which is sufficiently large, the left half and the right half don't talk to each other. Now, as to your answer about translational invariance, um, if you take any translational invariance state in the thermodynamic limit, it will, you can still basically have this description. Now, this description kind of manifestly drops the translational invariant, like it's not apparent in here. But you can still take a translational invariance state and write in this form. Yeah, but, but you obviously don't have any entanglement on between AL and AR, right? Uh, okay, so you should think about AL and AR as being a decomposition of a Hilbert space A. That's not exactly a, a, a physical cut. Is that cut. real space? I see, I see. Yeah, it's not a real space cut. Right, right. It, uh, but in a thermodynamic limit, uh, you can think of it as a fuzzy cut. Um, but in the thermodynamic limit, you can think about that cut as being localized to some correlation length. So it's fuzzy over some region. I see. 
All right, so uh, so this is kind of what I'm calling a polygon state. And it turns out when you do the canonical purification of a polygon state, you also end up with a, a polygon state now on um, these four polys. And basically, heuristically, uh, you can think about doing some fuzzy cut uh, for each of the four regions. And there's a left, right. And I'll draw the tensor uh, uh, network picture of this. Um, and I'm going to draw it like inside out because I just, you know, like it's, uh, because it has uh, boundary conditions, um, but it basically looks something like uh, there's a bunch of legs that goes out, um, and then uh, and then there'll be like a tensor here, a unitary here, a unitary here, a unitary here. So we're basically going to. Um, I don't know if you can read that, but what I just wrote was I wrote like this zero state to the power eight. And then, uh, and then this is being like B bar. This is like B. This is A, and this is A bar. I don't know if that's clear at all what I'm doing, but basically, you take a product state, you apply four unitaries to it, and then you distribute the eight legs into the four respective region. And this is basically what the canonical purification of uh, a polygon state looks like. It's basically also uh, looks like a polygon state. Uh, Roger. Can I ask yeah, a hello. Uh, hi. Uh, can I ask a question? This is Andrei Nevedomsky from Rice. Uh, hello. Yes. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice. Uh, so, um, Roger. So, just to see if I'm on the same page as you, imagine that your system A consists of two spin halves. I I'm giving you a very dumb example. I'm trying to see yeah, if yeah, I'm yeah, correct okay. or not. Um, and so, let's say they form a bell pair, and let's say we form a spin singlet between the 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 spin in region A, and then okay. you. The Hilbert space is four dimensional. Mm -hmm. I don't want to spatially do a cut where I have spin one and spin two because clearly they're entangled. Mm -hmm. But what I could do is that I could divide the Hilbert space into a singlet and a triplet and declare that my wave function is a direct product of only a singlet that, and I call this my left part, uh -huh. and the triplet would be my right. And in okay. that sense, um, it would be it would appear as a product wave function. Yes, Would yes, and in fact, you can do that for any wave function. Let's say it again. In fact, you can do that for any pure wave function. Uh, uh, yes, you can always uh, find a composition as follows, yes. All right, so would that be a good example of a polygon state? Um, okay, so not so quite because <laughs> for you to define a polygon state, um, uh, at least uh, when I have this one, you should think about it as uh, this, uh, uh, I kind of need like two environment and an A and a B where you can divide A, you can divide B. So your example is a, a little too small. The simplest example of say a polygon state is, um, uh, okay, so, uh, so you're aware of the construction for the AKLT states, right? So the AKLT um, is basically where you take a bunch of spin one halves well, okay, so it's basically uh, where you take a bunch of spin ones. Um, uh, so this is a site, this is a site, this is a site, this is a site. And then basically you put these into uh, bell pairs, right? Exactly. Um, now there's an additional step in the AKLT where you have to project onto the spin one space. But if you don't do that step, you get a polygon state before the projection. After the projection, you kind of ruin it. And so it becomes a polygon state in the thermodynamic limit still, but not exactly a polygon state at the microscopic level. Perfect. That, that, that's what I had in mind. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. But in this particular case, the entanglement is between, say, AR and BL. Mm -hmm. And this will be BR and CL. Okay. Um, all right, so this is kind of the definition of a polygon state. And the reason why we define it is because it's a natural uh, uh, way to describe gap phases in the thermodynamic language. Uh, and uh, it basically says that, uh, uh, heuristically saying, it's basically saying that I can decompose A in a way so that uh, uh, there's some left region and there's some right region that basically, uh, so that the left region talks to the the region to the left of it, and the right region talks to the region right of it. Uh, and basically, uh, the left and the right aren't really uh, uh, are disentangled already. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, so now that I've talked about polygon status, um, it turns out the polygon state, when you apply this measure H, um, just like the same argument for a gap phase, you're going to get zero. And that's basically because all the entanglement uh, between say A bar and B bar, or all, right, all the entanglement between A and B is captured by this unitary down here. All the entanglement between B and B bar is captured by a unitary. These are all separate unitaries. And so when you do the calculation for what the entanglement are and do the subtractions, all the contribution from neighboring pieces cancel. So that's basically the same as the heuristic argument before, but when you kind of plug this in, you get zero exactly. So uh, when you say zero, do you really mean it's exactly zero? Uh, for polygon state, it's exactly zero. Um, but you should think about a polygon state as a thermodynamic limit of a gap state. So for a gap state, there'll be some exponentially small correction based on what the correlation length is and the size of the region. Uh -huh. But for polygons, they'll be exactly zero. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, so also, just want to make sure here, you, you emphasized this decomposition of HA and HB uh, may not be the, may not have- uh, It's the, not a real space decomposition. Yeah, but that, can it be, uh, can you redefine the real space size? Can you always redefine the real space size such that this is a real space decomposition? Well, one way you can think about it is uh, uh, there's a way to disentangle uh, uh, A so that it decomposes into AL and AR. So, um, so if I were to reverse the process of taking a polygon state and turning it into a product state, I would just have to track down what these three unitaries are. And you should think of them as disentangler in, in the opposite direction. And in that case, they do become kind of real space after the disentangling. Uh -huh. Thanks. Okay. All right, so now that I've talked about polygon states, I'll also talk about a uh, sum of polygon states. Um, a sum of polygon states is somewhat similar, except there's an extra sum over mu. So you'll see now the expression uh, are somewhat similar, except for this uh, 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 sum over mu. Similarly for B, I do the same. It's the same mu index for all or for decomposition. Um, and once again, I'm gonna write my, my wave function as a product of uh, free wave functions, but now it's a sum over that. In uh, the tensor uh, network language, what I'm doing is that I am uh, once again, starting with my six legs um, and uh, this will be EL, AL, AR, BL, BR, ER. I'm going to apply my unitaries uh, to them pairwise. So that this is ultimately going to be my A, this is going to be my B, and uh, the remaining uh, is going to be E. The only difference between what I'm doing now and earlier is that what I'm going to throw in here is I'm going to throw in a cat state. Uh, uh, so the way you should think about it is that uh, um, a product state, I can write down as a um, some wave function to the power six, but basically I'm just, I can just kind of uh, but I can do the sum of that. And I can put arbitrary coefficients in them and now, you know, normalization and stuff. So that's the difference uh, between a polygon state and the sum of polygon states. And uh, the formal uh, uh, way that I'm doing is that the Hilbert space decomposes as a sum of products. <clears throat> um, and similarly, you can also calculate H for sum of polygon states. Um, and basically what you find is uh, it's, it's zero again. And I'll basically kind of work out why. Um, so we've already said that for each polygon state it's going to be zero because all the UV contribution cancels out. When you do a sum of polygon states, so uh, in this case, uh, once again, uh, H is equals to, in this case, S, S, A ball plus S, a B minus S A minus S B. <clears throat> uh, when you do a sum of polygon states, um, and there should be a coefficient right here that depends on mu, <clears throat> uh, such that uh, sum of C mu square is equals to one, so that the other free wave function are normalized. What happens here is, is that uh, the entanglement entropy of each of these pieces increases uh, based on the entanglement entropy of C mu. 
So, uh, for example, S of AA bar is going to be what the, entang uh, the entanglement entropy of the individual uh, 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 pieces uh, plus the entanglement entropy coming from C. Um, uh, but the thing is that it, uh, because I have two positive terms and two negative terms, it cancels. So uh, this is my heuristic way without doing the full calculation to uh, uh, show why it cancels and goes to zero. Uh, if you're uh, familiar with the language of subprobable states, um, this is basically what happens What uh, 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 happens when you purify a subprobable state. And so um, what uh, uh, the CMU introduces, it introduces a bunch of classical correlations, which basically cancels uh, uh, because I have a, 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 a two positive terms and two negative terms. Uh, any questions? Roger, maybe maybe a conceptual question. Could yes. you say what kind of states can be written as a sum of polygon states? Is there a sharp statement you could make about gap states or gapless? Yes. When is it possible? Yes. When it's not? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, that's a great question. Um, so the motivation for a sum of polygon state is okay. So the motivation for a polygon state is that it's basically uh, look, it's a, basically a description of gap states in some thermal dynamic limit. The motivation for some polygon uh, uh, states is that suppose that you have a, a phase that's symmetry breaking. So, um, so uh, the cartoon picture for say an Ising symmetry breaking phase is that the grand state is a bunch of uh, plus, uh, and there's also a grand state which is a bunch of minus. And any superposition of those two is also a eigenstate. So uh, a superpositions of those two, you can think about as sum of polygon state. And the superposition stretch of, uh, uh, for as big as your system size. Now, what's, uh, 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 when I say sum of polygon state, I'm basically allowing for the fact that in my cartoon picture, it's just a product wave function. But if you kind of like, if there's entanglement uh, uh, at, uh, between neighboring sites, it still basically kind of works. So you should think about now as uh, one example is basically uh, any sum of spontaneous symmetry broken uh, states. Uh, and sorry, may I follow on this? So, so yes. you're saying that in reality, we have some correlation with it. And, and you yeah, so in reality, some, yes, you, yes. Some, some measure that can get rid of this correlation length, but I, I just don't see that the edge would do that, does it? Uh, so in order to get rid of this correlation length, you basically need the regions A and B to be much larger than the correlation length. So we are allowing there to be a finite correlation length. And what that basically means is that uh, uh, A and B are entangled, uh, uh, B and uh, uh, E are entangled, but there's a, uh, uh, but in some sense, I'm saying that A and E uh, R are not entangled. So that's one way of basically saying that region size are much larger than the correlation length. And they are now well approximated by polygon states and sum of polygon states. Thank you. Okay. And, and uh, we also colloquially call these cat states, uh, name after Schrodinger's cat. All right, so the final uh, 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 property uh, for H is basically uh, what happens now when you apply to conformal field theories uh, uh, in one plus one D. Now it's definitely not gap. Um, and basically I'm just gonna use the Cardi formula. Um, so, uh, when, uh, so if I'm gonna start from uh, uh, say a segment of AB and then I'm gonna take the canonical purification Basically what happens is you should heuristically think about this. Uh, 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 you get a conformal field theory on the circle where there's a particular length. So there's like length of A, length of B, length of B, length of A. That's heuristically the way that you should think about what happens uh, when you take a canonical purification. Um, there are some UV physics that happens uh, 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 at the intersection. But uh, overall, basically, it still looks like a conformal field theory on the circle. And so if you just apply uh, the uh, Cardi formula, um, S of uh, AA bar, it's going to be uh, something like C over 3 log of uh, 
two L A over A plus C over three of a uh, log of L A. Okay, hold on. I actually messed up a little bit. Um, the actual formula is log of sine of dot 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 dot. Um, uh, when you take a segment uh, and look at the entangled entanglement entropy on the circle. Um, and when you work it out, um, it turns out uh, that the answer you get at the end is always going to be C over three log two. Um, so one of the interesting things first is that the, uh, the last length scale A, even though it shows up in each of the individual term, once again cancels. Uh, in addition, it also turns out that the, uh, the uh, the, the system size LA and LB also cancels. Now, uh, what I'm kind of showing is, I should say, it's just a heuristic calculation. Um, uh, they are more careful calculations for one plus one DCFTs that basically shows this answer and agrees with it, but it involves basically a lot of replicas. Uh, uh, and that's a more rigorous uh, uh, derivation. The heuristic definition basically says that it's sealed free log two. And the basic idea of uh, uh, why uh, it's both UV and IR dependence is as follows. Um, if let's say I take a uh, segment and I look at AB and then I want to uh, uh, look at, uh, I can kind of do a conformal transformation and think about uh, 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 being on a circle instead with some A here and some B here. And this is basically the environment. Um, because I only have three segments, you can always pick a conformal uh, uh, transformation so that uh, uh, I can exactly specify where the three segments are. Let's say I want them to be equally divided. So there's always some conformal transformation that takes me from my uh, initial uh, uh, geometry to a fixed geometry where say A, B and the environment have the exact same sizes. <clears throat> Um, now, what happens though is that I'm going to have to uh, mess around with the UV physics when I do this conformal transformation. But because this uh, quantity happens to be UV independent, um, that UV physics doesn't show up. So that's the heuristic argument of why it gives a universal quantity for CFTs. And later I'll show numerics for it uh, uh, that agrees with it. All right, so uh, in summary, um, uh, this measure that I've introduced uh, satisfy a number of properties. So once again, it's non-negative, it vanishes for grand states of gap systems and also sums of those, uh, and it gives the central charge for CFT. So basically it would distinguish between critical phases and gap phases. Uh, so uh, any questions before I move on? Okay, okay. Uh, so now um, this is just one measure I've introduced um, and I apologize uh, uh, for taking so long. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce all the measure. And before I do that, I'm, uh, I'm gonna talk about this idea called the entanglement of purification. So earlier I've explained what a purification is. A purification is basically where you go from a density matrix to a pure wave function so that um, it looks the same in the subregion AB. Um, I've written it kind of like, if you want to purify a system on AB with say CD, then this is what you get. The entanglement of purification is basically uh, done by look at all possible purification of AB and asking which one of those has the minimum entanglement. So uh, the pictorial way of saying is that suppose that I start with um, uh, AB what I want to do is I want to find the purification uh, A, B, C, D, um, which means that uh, uh, I'm gonna, uh, another way to think about uh, uh, what a pur uh, uh, purification is, is that uh, all purifications are related by unitary transformation on the purified space. Um, 
And what I want you to do is I want to look for purification A, B, C, D, which minimizes the entanglement uh, of the left half of the right half. So uh, another way to phrase it is that you can take a purification and you can ask what unitary can you apply to the purified space that minimizes the entanglement. Uh, so this also is basically uh, related to a disentangling problem of how to minimize entanglement by applying a some unitary. And this is the definition for entanglement purification. All right, so I'm going to state a few facts about entanglement purifications. Um, in fact, it satisfies a number of inequalities. Uh, and please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, do uh, slow me down. All right, so the first inequality is that the entanglement purification of AB is always less than the reflected uh, uh, entropy of AB. Um, and this uh, is true basically by definition. And the reason is, uh, in both cases, I'm looking at a entropy that comes from the purification. Um, so in this case, uh, in the left case, I'm looking at A, B, C, D, and I'm looking at the optimal case that, uh, that purifies this. In the right case, I'm just looking at a very specific purification and I'm looking at the entanglement entropy here. So basically by definition, because EP is the minimization of all purifications, it has to be less than S all which is only one, comes from one uh, specific purification. All right, so uh, the other property is that EP is also less than S of A and S of B. And uh, the way that I'm gonna show that is for example, to show that EP is less uh, uh, than SA, what I'm going to do is uh, if I have AB and I have some purification, it doesn't matter what the purification is, I'm just going to uh, throw everything I have uh, uh, into uh, one side. So in other words, I'm going to uh, uh, pick uh, uh, D to be empty. And I'm going to have C equals to everything. And in this particular case, then the entanglement between uh, AD, the left half and the right half is just exactly entanglement between A and everything else. So because I can construct this particular purification, um, once again, EP needs to be less than that because EP is an optimized uh, minimum. Okay, so the third statement is that uh, two times the entanglement purification is greater than uh, the mutual information. And I'm going to prove that also, uh, and basically involve a, a strong subadditivity again. So what I want you to do is I want you to show two EP of A, B minus the mutual information. What I want you to show is I want you to show that this quantity is not negative. And basically involves me exp expanding what all the terms are and just uh, using strong subadditivity. So the uh, on the left is uh, two times S A D. Uh, uh, so assume that you have, I have the optimal decomposition that gives me the entanglement of purification. On the right side, I'm going to have um, SAB minus SA minus SB. Um, okay, um, because this entire thing is pure, I can write this as uh, SBC plus SAD. I'm not going to change anything about the uh, the right side. And I'm basically going to use strong subadditivity right here. So this is greater than or equals to. So strong subadditivity basically says that the sum of two entanglement is greater than its union plus this uh, intersection. So the union is S, B, A, B, D, and its intersection is S, A. Um, these two cancel. And then uh, because this is a pure wave function, um, S A B D is the same as S C. And I I'm end up with uh, the mutual information uh, between B and C. I've messed up somewhere because there's a sign here.
Uh, sorry, you were supposed to subtract I, but you added I. I am a bit surprised. Uh, I think. No, no. Okay, so I is defined as S A plus S B minus S A uh, A B. So I did, in fact, uh, subtract I here. Um, actually, I think this is okay. Um, this is still a uh, uh, positive. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, if I find an error, I'll come back and fix it. Um, this is one of the problems of uh, <laughs> doing this live. But in any case, uh, what I basically uh, uh, show or what, what is supposed to be true is that for any basically uh, uh, purification CD, uh, the inequality is true, and so it's also true for the optimal purification, uh, the entanglement of purification. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so uh, in light of that, um, we're gonna define G, which is our other entanglement measure as being uh, the uh, entanglement, two times entanglement purification minus I, because the first one is bigger than the second one. And once again, trust me that the first one is definitely bigger than the second one, <laughs> whether or not I got the proof on the previous page correct. Um, and so once again, if you expand it out, it looks like this. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I'm going to now go over a bunch of properties of G, just like I went over properties of H. Um, first, it's not negative, uh, just because I'm uh, uh, the way it constructed. It turns out it once again vanishes for grand states of gap Hamiltonian, and I'll show that in a second. <laughs> uh, does not vanish for some of a uh, 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 orthogonal ground state, so what we call sum of a uh, polygon state. So it vanishes for polygon state, and it does not uh, uh, vanish for polygon state. And once again, it's sensitive to critical behavior. So I'm going to basically uh, uh, go through uh, some of this stuff again. Okay, so uh, so once again, uh, uh, if I want to look at the entanglement purification, so the question is, what is the entanglement of purification? for a, a quantum spin chain. So if you take a spin chain, you take two region A and B next to each other. Um, well, if this was the ground state of a gap uh, uh, system, then what will happen is that you expect EL and ER to be uncorrelated. You expect EL to be not correlated with B, et cetera. In fact, if this was a ground state of a gap system, then uh, you already have uh, basically the purification. Um, and you just make the left piece D and you just make the right piece C. And the reason you can, uh, 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 that makes sense is because you expect uh, uh, D to be un only correlated with A and uncorrelated with B and C. So in some sense, I've kind of shuffle off all the information that's correlated with A to the left, all the information that's correlated with B and the right. In this particular case, then uh, the entanglement of purification of A, B, it's actually just the Bob high tide entanglement information of this entire chain. Uh, uh, it's just being uh, uh, SAD on this cut right here. In contrast, uh, the mutual information of AB is uh, two times the, uh, the Bob high tide entanglement uh, uh, information, which in this case, once again, is uh, SAD. And so here, um, when you subtract them, uh, G of AB, uh, because of this factor of two, two EP minus I, you get basically zero. Now, this is basically the uh, heuristic uh, uh, construction of uh, why you get zero. Roger, sorry, how did yeah. you get the entanglement entropy to be twice the SAD? Uh, isn't the oh, okay. entanglement entropy is in, supposed to involve only SA and SB? Yes, okay, so um, that is correct. So it's SA plus SB uh, B minus SAB. 
if you were doing with a gap system, then uh, the entanglement entropy of SA is just going to, okay, so I'm going to have to label the free cut. I'm going to label the cut here, one, two, and three. The entanglement entropy of SA for a gap system or for a polygon state is just the entanglement entropy of one plus like S2, right? Because I'm just using the area law. And in the 1D case, it's just the two boundary points. And then for two is two and three. And then SAB is S1 plus S3. So yeah, that makes sense now. Okay. And then you use the fact that S3 is the same as S1 by symmetry problem. Yep. Um, and that basically uh, uh, is the uh, general argument. And once again, uh, using tensor networks, uh, there's a much uh, 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 more rigorous way to see that is exactly um, zero. All right, so what happens when you do G for conformal field theories? Well, once uh, it turns out we have no clue how to calculate this. We don't actually know what this number is. But what we're going to basically uh, uh, try to argue again and using basically a very similar argument as previously is that we're going to try to argue as UV independent and it's also kind of geometric independent. And the basic heuristic argument once again is as follows. So you start with a line with AB. Through a conformal transformation, you can always map a line to a circle where there's some environment E and there's some region A and there's some region B. Now, if I do another conformal transformation again, I can basically fix it. I can fix the geometry because there's only three regions. I can fix the geometry. So uh, say uh, in this particular case, uh, one quarter, one quarter, one half. Um, and so I'm relying on the fact that uh, the conformal transformation can basically map any three points to any other three points. Now, what happens, of course, is that when I do this, I kind of mess around with the uh, uh, UV length scale, right? So if I vary the, uh, the system size in a conformal transformation, then the UV length scale kind of also has to change. <laughs> and for me to uh, uh, basically... Uh, uh, to justify that it's not UV dependent, I'm going to look at the expression again for uh, G, which is uh, <clears throat> equals to uh, S uh, A D two S A D plus S A B minus S A minus S B. Okay. Um, I'm gonna kind of look at, uh, draw it this way, A, B, C, D. Okay, so um, it, okay, so you'll notice that there's three terms that you're adding on the left side and two terms that you're subtracting on the right side. So it looks like it isn't going to work. Um, and importantly, uh, uh, when you kind of expand this out, you get uh, uh, an arc this way. And uh, uh, I'm gonna expand S, A, D as being S, A, D plus S, B, C an arc this way um, plus an arc this way minus uh, an arc this way and minus an arc this way. And it looks like you have two of these extra points on the top. So the, the argument that uh, I'm going to make right now is that because uh, uh, my goal is to basically uh, make the entanglement here as small as possible, because I'm looking at the entanglement of purification. So I want, I'm going to want C and D to be as unentangled as possible. Um, the procedure which disentangles C and D basically makes these two entanglement universal. So that even though there is some uh, uh, entanglement between C and D that shows up twice in this expression, I'm going to argue that it's universal uh, regardless of uh, what your original UV physics is. So that's my heuristic argument. And the, the rest of the other points do in fact cancel. Um, so this point here, this point here, this point here. Uh, uh, any questions?
All right, so what I say here might not be very satisfactory. And this is basically where we turn to numerical data. Um, we actually like run this. Um, and the model that we're gonna take uh, is uh, a 1D quantum system, which is given by this Hamiltonian. All right, so um, this is, you should think of this as a chain of Majoranas. Um, the first term is the standard term for which you couple the Majoranas so that you get a critical uh, uh, Ising phase. Um, and the coupling is the self, the coefficient one. The modification we're making is that we're introducing a four fermion term with coefficient lambda that couples basically four fermions at a particular uh, location. Um, so it's A minus two, A minus one, and we skip A and then we do the next two. And it turns out the phase diagram is as follows. So um, at lambda equals to zero, we get the Ising critical because uh, this term alone makes it critical. Um, it turns out that this does not gap out the system. Um, this term is actually, in fact, uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, not relevant. Um, and when lambda is large, what that does is it actually forces it to spontaneously dimerize. Uh, that is to say the pairs of Majoranas pairs up. Um, and it goes through the transition through a tricritical transformation as some lambda. <clears throat> So uh, this stuff is discussed in the paper, but the reason why we're looking at this is because it gives us access to two critical phases uh, uh, and uh, a gap phase. And so what we do is we look at both G and H as a function of lambda and system size. So on the left is G, uh, the horizontal axis is one over system size. Um, for some reason we have flowing points for the edge, but basically uh, left is thermodynamic limit right is small system size. So it's about how it approaches the answer as you go left. And then the four different lines are the four different points. So I've got a point here, I've got like a point here, another point here, another point here. And what you can see is that the uh, three points that corresponds to the uh, Ising phase. Oh, so I should, I should mention that um, this entire region is Ising critical. Um, and then there's a tricritical point and then the entire region over here is gapped. So for the three points uh, uh, on the left, it approaches some value 0.45 for G and for the tricritical uh, 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 point, it approaches some other value, which is around like 0.73. We do the same thing for H. And once again, we get the same features. Um, for the three points, which are eyes and critical, it approaches uh, uh, some value right here, which is around uh, 0.12 ish. And then uh, for the tricritical, it points something like around 0.16. And this is basically done uh, by uh, finding out what the grand state is on a uh, circle uh, first. Uh, using a, a tensor network optimization and then constructing the purifications and then just kind of cranking it all out. <clears throat> and in fact, we've actually tabulated in the data um, for a number of phases. Um, so we did the Ising and tricritical Ising. Um, we also did the free boson <clears throat> and we have the central charge listed here. And what we find is that uh, H um, is in fact, uh, C over three log two. So keep in mind that log two is roughly 0 0.693. And so we find that H depends only on central charge and nothing else based on our numerics. When we did G, we find that it does, uh, uh, um, uh, we, we by the way also did it for different system sizes. So like these numbers uh, uh, don't change when we change the system sizes and also when we change uh, uh, the model parameters. And we find out uh, uh, numerically, these are the universal values. What's interesting is that uh, for the three bosons uh, with different radii, they all have the same central charge, but um, we find that they have different Gs, uh, but the same H. So, um, and that's because we know H is only sensitive to central charge. But what this tells us is it tells us that G is sensitive to something beyond central charge. Um, and if we can figure out exactly what it is, or if we have a table, we can find out what the radius is just from um, uh, looking at G and H. <clears throat> and so the summary of um, uh, kind of the two measures G and H is that 
it allows a certain uh, diagnosis of various uh, uh, phases. In particular, if you have a unique rank state, um, it just gives you zero uh, for a gap system. For CFT, it gives you a CO3 log two and something which we uh, numerically uh, find as universal, but we don't know exactly what it is. Um, and when you have a sum of states like cat states, uh, it turns out in one case you get zero, in another case you get log of the degeneracy. So this is a summary of uh, uh, G and H. Um, any questions? Uh, hi, Roger. Can uh, I ask yes. a question? Yes, please. So uh, can the G and H, dis well, one of them can, but uh, can G distinguishes between a theory, a CFT, and its orbital version of the, I mean, a related theory that is coming from the original one? From we one. believe so. Um, so we didn't actually do, uh, do any of the orbital uh, stuff. Uh, uh, one very I, simple orbifold you can do just changes the radius. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so, okay. Well, so not, not exactly, yeah. but one of them it could be Ising squared. The other is I don't yeah. know what normalization. Um, use. No, no. There is an orbifold for the compact boson that just changes the radius. You mean like one versus two, right? Like you just double or like quadruple yeah. the radius, oh, right? Sure. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So um, we believe so, but we haven't exhaustively uh, uh, checked it. Um, though they are kind of, um, uh, yeah, I just wonder if like, okay, you have a, do you have a free fermion point in your, in your, uh, in your notation? Uh, the know. free fermion point will be, I believe R equals to one. Um, oh, so okay. no, we so didn't do have... that one. We did not do that one. Right. I and you're asking whether it's the same as, uh, twice as Ising. Um, well, yeah, basically. I think. Okay. It looks like it might not be, but okay. I yeah. Don't um, uh, I think it should be different in general, though I think I remember there was this one weird case uh, with free fermions where it turns out to be the same, but in general, we think it should be different. Okay. Um, uh, and that's because like there are some, entang we know there are entanglement measures for which a uh, theory uh, is over for is definitely different. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh there's no reason why G would not be sensitive to that, but we actually didn't very carefully go through that. Okay. Yeah, it looks, it looks kind of weird, right? Like uh, you arranged the table in a strange way, but it's not monotonically changing with the radius. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like the two is actually right between these two. Yeah, so... So, so there's some like uh, uh, errors in here too. Uh, um, uh, are you sure of the, nu of the numerical convergence? Uh, They're all about 0.9, so... So uh, I'm reasonably sure, I didn't do it though. Um, the student, uh, Yi Jin, uh, did the numerics, but I'm uh, pretty confident in his abilities. Um, but yes, you are right. Um, we haven't actually fully kind of figured out, but we do know it's dependent on the radius. But yes, uh, that is uh, uh, something that we haven't kind of uh, figured what it is. And a lot of this basically come from numerics because like basically like we do the numerics, we get the grand state and then we crank through the computer of what we think the uh, entangled purification is, which by the way, is not something we know, uh, uh, it's a very difficult quantity to calculate. Um, and then, uh, uh, and these are the numbers. And basically um, the way we check it is we just change the system sizes. So um, these three bosons come from an XXZ model and we uh, basically change the system sizes uh, uh, to kind of confirm that we get the same number. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna go through a bunch of conjectures. Okay, oh, by the way, um, one thing I didn't quite say is, um, so what we've shown is what G and H are for certain states. What's also been proven um, that we prove, and I didn't tell you the proof is that it kind of goes backwards. So if you get zero for G, then it has to basically take the form of a polygon state. If you get zero for H, then it has to be a sum of polygon state or a polygon state. So that's something that uh, we've also proven. Um, that I haven't shown here, um, but basically uh, what I said earlier also kind of works backwards. All right, so now uh, here's a conjecture that we don't know. The first one is uh, whether G is bigger than or equals to H. Uh, numerically, that's what we always find. And there's a number of reasons to believe that. Um, this is equivalent to saying that two EP is bigger than or equals to SR because that's how G and H are defined. It turns out that uh, if Reflect entropy is monotonic um, under local operations. That implies the statement. So that's what, another reason why we believe it. Um, we don't know of any proof about the monoticity of SR 
But once again, numerically, it shows seems like it's always true. Um, uh, if this conjecture is true, then we can what we can think about is we can think about g minus h as basically a measure that counts the number of GHZ states between a, b, and its environment. Because that's the difference between a polygon state and the sum of polygon states, because that's what g minus h depicts. Um, uh, and so, and another reason why it's interesting is that in holography, g minus h is basically like order, like uh, it's subleading. Um, it's basically zero. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so this is a conjecture we have. Um, um, and it all, it's true, it gives you a physical interpretation for what g minus h is. Uh, H we kind of already know is how far you're deviating from the sum of polygon states. <clears throat> Another conjecture is uh, uh, when G is equals to H, basically when G minus H is zero, um, it seems like it's only true also when H is zero. So the only point where G equals to H is when they are both zero. And this is something that we only have based on numerics, mostly numerics. Um, uh, you can try to give it a physical interpretation to this statement if it's true. Uh, maybe it's basically saying that the only state that has no tripartite uh, uh, or GXZ type entanglement is that if it also has no tripartite entanglement. Um, I don't know how well that flies. All right, so I promised that I'll talk a little bit about 2D phases, and I'll do that in the last few minutes. Um, and it's basically using what we had earlier uh, uh, to diagnose if a phase is a gappable edge. Okay. So here goes. Uh, imagine you have a phase on the sphere. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a north pole and a south pole. <clears throat> and then what I'm going to do is for the remaining, uh, uh, the middle part is going to divide into three pieces. And keep in mind, this is a sphere. So the way I'm going to draw it is that there's going to be three pieces, which I'm going to call A, B, and C. And A and C touch on the back of the sphere. So from the top view, it'll basically look like this, A, B, C. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, and, and the procedure we're gonna do as follows. Okay, so you have a, a grand state wave function on a sphere. And what we're going to do is that we're going to uh, uh, um, minimize over all unitaries acting on the north and all unitaries acting on the south of H of A colon B of uh, UN US uh, op acting on my wave function. So my wave function uh, uh, lives in uh, um, A, B, and C. Um, I guess actually, okay, so let, let actually the way it's gonna work is that uh, they're gonna intersect. <clears throat> So N overlaps with A, B, and C, and so does S. And what, what I'm basically doing is I'm taking one tri-intersection of A, B, C, which is at the North Pole, and the other tri-intersection of uh, A, B, C, which is at South Pole. I'm going to apply unitaries uh, uh, there to try to disentangle them. And I'm going to uh, minimize uh, H of A, B, uh, subject to uh, all the possible unitaries I can apply at the pole. And I claim that, uh, um, I guess uh, I'll call this uh, J for the lack of a uh, uh, better letter. And I claim that J is equals to zero if the edge is gappable. And uh, it will be proportional to the central charge of the edge if the uh, J is not gappable, uh, if the phase is not gappable. All right, so the basic idea is as follows. Uh, what the disentangler does um, the best, if, if the phase is gappable, then what the disentangler do, so if it's gappable, then what the disentangler will do, um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, kind of uh, uh, use the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the Riemann sphere. So A, B, C, this is N, and then this is S. If it is gappable, then uh, what the unitary and N is going to do is that it's just going to gap out ABC and it's just going to hollow it out. It's just going to give me um, 
uh, it's just going to give me basically a trivial state right here. And similarly, uh, outside, which is the south pole, it, should, uh, uh, it will also be trivial and it will have gap edges. So this will be a, a gap edge and this here will be a gap edge. And now that I have an annulus geometry, uh, I can think of this as a very, very thick 1D system. Um, and because A, B, and C are gap, uh, I should expect that H of A colon B is zero. Uh, any questions on this part? So the basic idea is that I'm gonna take a sphere and if I punch out the poles, it becomes annulus, which is basically like a 1D ring. Now, the reason we're using H instead of G, because it turns out if you do it for G, it doesn't actually work. Um, it's because when I do this thing, I can still have basically some correlation between the outer and the inner edge. And in fact, if you kind of work out the TQFT, um, what we're doing on a more technical level is that we are condensing some anion in the, uh, this edge and we're condensing some anion on the outer edge. And this condensation process can create cat states, uh, which is, uh, uh, and, and I meant cat states when viewed as ABC as a, a chain. Um, and so if you do G, G is sensitive to that. And, and because it's sensitive to cat state, it doesn't quite give you zero. Um, and when you try to optimize, it actually gives you a very funky result. But H, because it's insensitive to cat states, it's the perfect tool to basically uh, 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 look for gap edges. Um, in contrast, if the edge was ungappable, then the best you can do, even if you try to hollow out the middle, is that what you do is you get a CFT at the edge with a certain central charge. And what H does, it'll give you the central charge of that um, when viewed as a, a 1D system. And so uh, this is one particular way that you can basically uh, uh, look for gap edges uh, using purely entanglement uh, properties. All right. so. Um, I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, so in this talk, I have basically introduced two quantities and described what they do. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. I'm sure we're all uh, applauding you from our bedrooms. Okay. Um, <laughs> very good. So we had a lot of uh, questions during the talk, but if anybody would like to ask a few more, go ahead. Um, just just one question. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so it seems to me that there is a Cardi procedure for H, but not for G. Is that true? Um, so we know what the answer is for H for CFT. Um, and it also, uh, numerically speaking, H is very easy to calculate because it's a procedure to get the uh, canonical purification. Uh, G, uh, we have a code for it and it requires some optimization because it's a minimization over all possible purification. Uh, so we don't know theoretically what it gives and numerically we need some optimization algorithm too on it. Okay. Could Does you say a little question? bit more about that optimization? Um, okay. Uh, oh, I got extra slide here, okay. Um, so to calculate, okay, so uh, to calculate G, well, okay, so calculating G is the same as calculating EP. So to calculate EP, what you do is basically, uh, um, if I think about having A and B, so, so first step, what we do is we purify AB, right? So now we have a pure state on AB. And so one way to phrase uh, what the optimization is, is that uh, EP is the minimization over all unitary acting on E. Technically it's isometry, it's actually not unitary. Uh, um, uh, 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 and then what you try to minimize is you minimize the entanglement of uh, S of A and then E left. So the way we do it is that uh, we purify it first and then we just go, uh, 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 and then we optimize the unitary that you apply on E's that minimize the entanglement of AE prime. And what you ideally want to do is that this is like a disentangling problem. I want to uh, reduce the amount of entanglement between uh, EL and the rest of this, uh, uh, and the right half of the system. I want to minimize the entanglement between ER and the left half of the system. And like most disentangling algorithm, it depends on how good your initial guess is and they occasionally get stuck. But that's basically what we do. Uh, we minimize this. And there's also the caveat is that like uh, E has to be a sufficiently large Hilbert space 
uh, on both the left and the right side so that uh, we're going through uh, uh, enough uh, decompositions. Right, what, what kind of states are you varying over? Uh, well, we're varying over unitaries. So we start whatever state, like these states are usually grand states of uh, uh, the Hamiltonians we get. And then we start with some initial state, uh, which is typically the canonical purification in fact. And then we just basically optimize over all the unitaries. Given by like a circuit or something? Uh, no, uh, we're doing the dense representation. Interesting, okay, thank you. Um, so we're doing some like conjugate gradient uh, uh, algorithm. So it's not really, uh, it, we're not, opt we wish to optimize over all unitaries, but we're just basically doing some conjugate gradient descent. So it, based, it depends very heavily on the initial guess and how good it is. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so maybe if there are no more questions, we can leave it at that. Thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Roger, so I have a, so I have do I have a detailed question for the uh, for, for the last? Hi, Roger. Hello. Hi. Uh, so I have a detailed question for the last um, last uh, uh, slide. So we make a trivial for here. We make a trivial phase, yeah, and then we do the n n young condensation mm -hmm. because so it, it is this so can we find uh, correspondence in one D system for uh, for this uh, tr uh, tr trivial phase part? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Uh, and, so, so for yeah, two D phase, parts. so yeah. any condensation is a process that happens for two dimensional topological phases, uh, and uh, and so whenever you have a boundary between a topological two topological phases, so trivial being the trivial one, um, the edge you can kind of do a number of things to the edge, yeah. and I'm kind of saying that all the important physics happens at the boundary between yeah. uh, the two phases. Uh, and the op and the optimization will hopefully find a one that has, yeah. that has this uh, smaller central charge. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so for one D system, so we cannot do the uh, so do the kind of do the condensation. Yeah, any of us don't live on one D. Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I've... Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. At the beginning, so uh, so we have an equation of. Uh, so I know down the equation of the uh, entanglement, so canonical in, uh, purification. So we have a square root of we and we, we so when we so in a part of the. Uh, of the tensor product, we have a square root of p p nu. So where where's that square root come from? Well, I I remember it's uh it's like the in a third or fourth slide. So I, I... um so the um uh the canonical purification is a wave function, um and it's a purification in the sense that when you trace out uh the auxiliary part, you get your original density matrix. Keep in mind when I say tracing our wave function, you first have to turn to a density matrix. So you square it back to get a density matrix and then you mm -hmm. trace out the ancilla part. Yeah. Okay. So that uh, for you to have a consistent and also a normalized wave function, you need to take all the coefficients from a density matrix and square root it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So what happens now? Uh, well, I, I guess I'll close the meeting um, and we go to have lunch. <laughs> okay. See ya. Have thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Have a good lunch, everyone. Uh, I'm, I think this talk went a little bit over time. I'm sorry, but. Uh... Well, we budget uh, an hour and a half for, okay. you know, to make sure that there are always a lot of questions. Okay, um, that's good, okay. So I think it was just right. Okay, thank you very much. 90 minutes is a perfect time. 
Oh, okay, thank you. Thank well, you. I, I I hope uh, it was interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.